Hi there, my name's Ron Wright. I teach here at the law school at Wake Forest University. Uh, and we're talking about criminal procedure, uh, in particular the criminal procedure investigation rules that apply to police when they put together a possible criminal case. One thing that the police have to do sometimes is they have to use force. They have to use physical force sometimes to arrest someone or otherwise stop them from moving around. So the rules for today deal with uh, how the police can use deadly force. Under what circumstances can they use so much force that the, uh, that the suspect uh, dies? Not a very typical situation, but a critical one. And we're going to talk about the rules for the use of deadly force. Let's go in and talk. Okay, folks, let's get started. We're going to talk today about the basics of Tennessee versus Garner, Garner basics. This is a case dealing with the use of deadly force by the police and the constitutional limits that try to control the use of deadly force. Now, there's a whole lot of criminal procedure law out there that relates to searches in private places. There's lots of cases and other sources of law, constitutional, statutory, otherwise, that deal with the question of whether the police can arrest. Are we allowed to hold this person, possibly to bring a charge? Uh, this is governed by the probable cause standard that we've talked about, but there's an awful lot of law developed around the question of whether to arrest. What we know a lot less about is how the police can arrest. What kind of force can the police use as they carry out an arrest? That's a little odd, isn't it? Wouldn't you think that the use of force would get a lot more attention? In the big picture of things, when a government agent is going to use physical force that could result in injury or possibly death, you would think that would be a central concern of the law. And it has become, over time, something of a concern. But lots more energy has gone into the search questions and into the probable cause slash whether to arrest questions. A lot less attention has historically gone into uh, the question of how to arrest or what kind of force is appropriate to use during an arrest uh, or during any other police uh, action. There are other sources of law that have always had some relevance here, have had some bearing on the use of force, but constitutional law over the years has had remarkably little to say about this. Partly this is a historical accident. The historical origins of the Fourth Amendment, the, uh, the prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures, it comes out of you know, tax disputes. Or, you know, can you find things that I'm in trying to import without paying the import tax? Uh, or the other you know, searches of printing presses for, uh, for pamphlets that criticize government officials. These are the concerns of relatively high level, let's say elite level colonists uh, who are, you know, upset with the way the king's government is enforcing the law. And so that was the backdrop for the drafters of the Constitution uh, who were worried about that particular kind of government intrusion that really didn't involve a lot of physical force against their bodies. Uh, there was, of course, a lot of physical force used against bodies, you know, government force used against suspects of crimes at the time, but those weren't the folks drafting the Fourth Amendment. So for historical reasons, we have been slow to come to this area of constitutional uh, regulation. But we're here now, and a big part of this is the case Tennessee versus Garner. I'll get to Garner in just one minute. First, let me tell you a little bit about what you typically see when it comes to police use of force. We know something about this setting because uh, the, uh, the U.S. government surveys citizens on a pretty regular basis and asks, have you had any contact with the police in the last year? And if so, did it involve any kind of use of force uh, of, of any level, use of a gun or anything else? So we have a pretty good idea. Every so often we get these snapshots of the police interacting with citizens. And we know that um, in the world of police citizen or police public contacts, less than 1% of those people surveyed say that uh, the, police officer who inter the police officer who interacted with them used or threatened to use uh, force. 
Although when you start talking about the pool of people who ended up being arrested, that's when the use of force, you know, the rates go up a good bit. And so from year to year, typically about one in four of the people who were arrested, the arrestees say, about 25% of them say, yeah, the police used some kind of force uh, in my case. What kind of force? Three quarters of the time or so, it's going to be some, something on the lower spectrum of use of force, weaponless tactics like pushing, grabbing, shoving, something along those lines. The remainder are going to be some form of maybe pepper spray, possibly uh, handgun use, whether it be the, the gun drawn or the gun actually discharged you know, by the police officer. Um, who's using the force and on whom? A fairly large percentage of these force cases involve uh, an arrestee or some other person who's under the influence of alcohol or drugs or who uh, is dealing with some kind of mental uh, illness. That, more, th that increases the rate of the use of force pretty dramatically uh, in these uh, cases. A relatively small proportion of the officers involved are you know, repeat players. If an officer is involved in one use of force, the odds go up considerably that you're going to see that officer's name again in other use of force cases. It's a fairly small pool of officers who, are, uh, who tend to use uh, force, uh, for better and for worse. Uh, there is not any particularly strong pattern, though, when it comes to the demographics of the officer. Uh, whether it be uh, by race or, well, we're learning more about gender. I think I'll hold off before making any claims on that. Uh, but that gives you some uh, idea about the, um, uh, about the general background on the use of force. Now let's focus on deadly force, Tennessee versus Garner. This happens in the, uh, in the late 1970s. Ultimately, the case comes up to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1985. It's Tennessee versus Garner, 471 U.S. 1. So at 10.45 p.m., it's Memphis. It's night. Officers Elton Hyman and Leslie Wright are dispatched to a home because the, home, the person in the home reported there's a prowler inside, a burglar. So Officer Hyman gets there, gets out of the car, goes behind the house, and hears a door slam. And then he sees somebody who turns out to be Edward Garner run across the backyard and stop at a six-foot-high chain-link fence at the edge of the yard. Iman, it's dark out, remember, has a flashlight, shines the flashlight, sees that this suspect uh, sees the face and hands, and the officer says later, I was reasonably sure that Garner at the time was unarmed. He estimates later on, he says, I think he was about five foot five inches tall, maybe five seven, weighs maybe 17, eight years, 18 years old, that was his estimate, but it turns out it was a smaller person, only five foot four inches, and the, the suspect was only 15 years old. Hyman, the officer, says, police, halt. But the suspect starts climbing the fence, uh, and so uh, to prevent escape, Hyman fires uh, the gun, kills Garner with a shot to the back of the head. There's a tort suit. Uh, obviously, there's no evidence that's being suppressed on the basis of this police action, uh, but the family of Garner does sue and say you used improper uh, force and in fact unconstitutional force and so we can recover under a federal statute in federal court for a civil rights violation. Supreme Court ultimately gets the case and asks a series of questions. The first question is an easy one. Was it a seizure? within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment that says you can't have unreasonable searches and seizures. Does this even count as a seizure? But yeah, the test is, is the person, does the f person feel free to leave? He's got a bullet in the back of his head. He does not feel free to leave. It, I mean, the, trivially easy uh, question. The harder question is, was this a lawful seizure? Yes, it was a seizure, but was it a lawful seizure? And traditionally, at common law, the ancient sort of Court developed, judge developed law in this setting said that you're allowed to use deadly force to stop a fleeing felon. If there's somebody who's suspected, probable cause, if you've got enough to believe this person committed a serious crime, a felony, and they're running away and you need force to stop them, then you're allowed to use 
deadly force for a fleeing felon if the test is defined by common law, by the traditional judge-created case law that was out there. What about Tennessee itself? Did they adopt this common law? Yeah, they did. There's a statute that had pretty much adopted the common law setting. It said that an officer can use deadly force after notice, you know, stop, police, uh, if there's a felon who is either fleeing or is forcibly ar uh, resisting arrest. So Tennessee law in its statutes had adopted what's called the fleeing felon rule. And the Memphis Police Department also allowed for what the officer did here, slightly more restrictive than the common law fleeing felon rule. But for our purposes, yeah, what the officer did was lawful under Tennessee rules and the Memphis Police Department rules. But is it valid under the Constitution? Does it violate the Fourth Amendment bar against unreasonable seizures? The court ends up saying, yes, it did. Gets there by way of what it calls a balancing test. So it asks on the one hand, what are the individual interests involved? How weighty are they? And then on the other hand, how weighty are the government's uh, interests in keeping something like a fleeing felon rule? Over on the suspect's side of things, there's loss of life. Hard to come up with an interest more weighty than that. And the court says, we're not going to reduce that interest just because the claim is that you assumed the risk. That is, you started running away and therefore you knew you were putting yourself in danger. Because assumption of the risk normally in tort law requires some kind of knowledge on the part of the person who was injured. You know, you know that you're getting into a risky situation. And the court says, we're not so clear that there's a showing here that this defendant knew just how risky this was to be, uh, to be running away. So at any rate, they say ind individual interests here, not much discounted by the assumption of the risk doctrine, loss of life, very weighty individual interest. On the other hand, government interest. What are those like? Well, it is important that suspects normally submit peacefully if a police officer wants to stop them, possibly arrest them. It's better for everybody, for an orderly society, if uh, generally speaking, suspects stop when they're told. But, says the court, most police departments, most governments, federal and state, get by without a fleeing felon rule. They make it, you know, they make it work. They're able to apprehend people and they're able to maintain public order without using deadly force in this setting. Although they say, you know, if we do get a situation where the fleeing felon is actually dangerous, presents danger of physical harm to the officer or to others, that changes the balance and might change the outcome. But here, where we don't have a particularly dangerous felon, just a fleeing felon, then the court says the balance here favors the individual. Those are the heavier interests. And so recovery is possible under the, uh, under the Constitution. So under what circumstances can a police department now use uh, deadly force. Well, the opinion says it would be okay to use deadly force in, in a situation where the police arrive and there is a suspect who threatens the officer with a weapon. I show up, I'm Officer Hyman, I shine my flashlight and I look into the backyard and there's somebody there who looks like they have a gun. I don't have to be sure, but it looks like they're threatening me with a weapon. Then that would be a proper basis for using deadly force. Another possibility is I'm investigating a crime that itself was uh, a physical danger to the officer or to others. I get a report of an aggravated assault or some other kind of major, you know, fight, shots fired, something like that. I arrive at that scene. Again, I'm allowed to use deadly force in that setting, not because I'm trying to prevent people from getting away, but I'm trying to prevent further injury either to officers or to the public. So uh, suspect threatens the officer with a weapon. I can use deadly force. Suspect is uh, possibly, have, I have probable cause to believe the suspect is involved in a violent crime. Again, I can use deadly force. Parenthetically, the court says burglary doesn't count even though a few burglaries do result in some kind of physical harm to others, most burglaries end up being nonviolent situations. So that's the first setting. You could think of it as 1A or 1B, armed suspect or suspect with a violent crime attached to the report. Next requirement, requirement two, 
uh, is that the force must be necessary to prevent escape. If I can catch them without using my gun, if I can just run them down, you have to do that. You can only use the deadly force as a last resort if other things aren't going to work. And then finally, the court says, where feasible, a warning must be given. So if I got those requirements, weapon or dangerous crime, force is necessary, if feasible, I gave a warning. If those requirements are met, then the Constitution allows deadly force. Otherwise, possible liability for the government, they're going to have to pay because it was an unreasonable use of deadly force, an unreasonable seizure. Now, how do different departments react to this? Well, obviously, Garner itself creates a constitutional minimum, but some departments add on to this and say there are, we're going to add further limits on the use of force by our uh, officers. Very often, departments will issue something called a force continuum that shows that the officer will encounter different levels of resistance from suspects, ranging from you know, the suspect ignoring the officer to the suspect verbally responding, you know, being non-compliant to running away to possibly using physical force from the suspect. So as you think of that as moving up a continuum of resistance from the, uh, from the suspect, departments have various ways of trying to match the level of police force to the level of resistance. It doesn't always have to be a precise match, but generally speaking, as you get more higher levels of resistance, that justifies higher levels of force from the police officer. The details vary from place to place, but there's a quite a, a elaborate world here built up around training for the continuum of force. I won't go into the details of the different ways the continuum plays out, but I will say this is all built on top of the basic, you know, uh, entry level rules, the, the uh, minimum requirements of Tennessee versus Garner when it comes to deadly force. Uh, it's also true that these laws are created in light of public opinion and political accountability. This gets into the paper. If the police uh, use force and injure somebody or kill somebody, and police departments ultimately have to respond to the public. Very often the police chief is appointed by a mayor who is elected by the public. Uh, there is some indirect political accountability for police work, and if the public is unhappy about the level of force being used against them, uh, then the department will change its rules to, uh, to get more in line with what the public wants. Similarly, there's tort liability. Somebody who's injured or killed by the police, either that person or that person's family might file suit and say, that, that just wasn't right. You used too much force there, more than you needed to. You need to pay me for my injuries, my hospital bills, my pain and suffering, whatever it is. And the jury that hears that case becomes, in effect, a regulator of the police. If you start getting a lot of jury verdicts saying, yeah, we award a million dollars in damages, the police department will, in the end, need to respond and get their uh, use of force practices in line with what juries find to be reasonable in the area. So I close with this observation that the use of force, historically not very heavily regulated by the Constitution, but it is an area where the Constitution has become relevant, is over time going to be more heavily regulated by the Constitution, and, <coughs> excuse me, it's regulated at different levels of law and politics. The Constitution, tort law, voter accountability, all of these levels of law have some bearing on when the police will use force to carry out an arrest or some other seizure. So it's a great example of complicated levels of a criminal procedure system. We'll talk again next time.